will call this meeting of the Richland County Board to order. I will ask the clerk to take the roll, please. Carol? Here. Miller? Here. Brewer? Here. Kramer? Here. McKee? Here. Hendricks? Here. Manning? Here. Yell? Here. Glassburner? Here. Harwick? Here. Woodhouse? Here. Turk? Here. Cosgrove? Here. Frank? Here. Severson? Williamson? Here. Cooey? Here. Fleming? Here. Brookins? Here. And McGuire? Here. We have 19 of 21 present. Good. Present for our invocation tonight is Pastor Tim Ward from the Richland Center Free Methodist Church. Right. You stand, please. Heavenly Father, as we pause for just a minute or two before we begin the reading, thank you for your wisdom and your mind and your heart. Father, in a day that uh, in a time that oftentimes is filled with rancor and anger and vitriol, I pray, Father, that you would give us the mind of Christ. Help us to be like him in all that we do and say, in all the decisions we make, Father, we pray that you would glorify yourself in us in Jesus' name. Amen. The clerk would lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which stands, one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Five, are we in compliance with the open meetings law? Yes, Mr. Chair, we're in compliance. We did have an occurrence with the agenda was posted last Friday down on the bulletin board. We noticed this morning it was removed. Don't know who did it, don't know when. But it was reposted again. It has been circulated to all the media outlets. It was posted to the county highway department. It's on our website, on WRCO's website. So it got circulated. We're not sure again who or when that occurred, but we're going to uh, put in a, a case that has glass that locks, so that won't happen again. So that brings us to approval of the agenda. A couple of notes on the agenda before we approve it. Public comment was inadvertently left off. We will be doing public comment tonight, so just so you're aware of that. And item number 25, we will be striking from the agenda for tonight. We'll pick that up again next month. So with those two notes, do I have a motion to approve our agenda? Motion by Mr. Brewer, second by Supervisor Kramer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Our agenda is approved. Uh, we do have minutes from two different meetings, the September 17th and 24th meetings of the county board that were circulated. Does anybody have questions, corrections, or issues with those two sets of minutes? Hearing no comments, I'll declare those minutes to be approved. And at this point, we will pause for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to address the board tonight? Anyone here in the room? Anyone online? All right, hearing none, we will move into the next item on the agenda, which is our public hearing on the proposed 2025 county budget. We'll open this public hearing with a short budget presentation. Okay, so this budget presentation is exactly what you have seen before. There have been very, very small tweaks to this presentation based on the guidance that this that the board gave me in the last review. Um, so to go over that again, um, you will see that our budget highlights, there is an increase in our investment income of $150,000. We are utilizing no general fund balance, no contingency fund, nor any ARPA funds to balance this budget. This does include a 5% wage pool. And what that means to clarify is we took the total of our wage budget and we added we 5% to that. That total is what we now are going to utilize to ensure that we can implement the wage study that we um, are in the process of completing right now. And so we have the dollars already set aside to do that and ensure that that implementation happens. So that was done through this budget process as well. Um, You'll see that there was a reduction in short-term borrowing for our capital improvement projects by $408,800. And this year, 
short-term borrowing will be done with a local bank. Uh, this is for the first time we're doing this. Uh, it is a much shorter process, much less labor intensive, and it saves us approximately $20,000 in bonding fees. So all outstanding um, points to make in this budget. And it keeps the money in the and it keeps the money in the community. We're, we're patronizing local business. So that's a win there too. Uh, the proposed budget revenues. So you can see here, we have listed out each area and how much revenue is anticipated for, um, for that line item with a total of $42,572,645 in proposed budget revenues. On the next slide, we talk about what those revenue types are. So we have county sales tax, we have interest on taxes, we have MFL and forest crop tax levy. That's the funding gap between the revenues that the county has and the expenses that the county has. Intergovernmental is state aid. Regulation and compliance are fines, forfeitures, and various other fees, permits, large group, et cetera. Public charges for service. These are departmental fees that are charged within various departments within the county. Sheriff, HHS, Pine Valley, et cetera. Other general revenues are various non-departmental fees. So rebated funds, short-term borrowing, and commercial revenues are our investment incomes from the general fund, um, from any judgments that are issued in circuit court. And then in highway, there's GTA, operational revenue, town and bridge, 50-50 cost share, wheelage tax, and our state maintenance agreements. So those are all ways that we, we generate revenues, okay? The next slide, we tweak this a little bit to make it easier to see and understand rather than the pie graph. Um, the proposed budget revenue, you'll see that tax levy makes up $10,341,006. Highway is about 4.4. Commercial revenue, 604,000. Other general, general revenue is about 1.5. Public charges for service are about 16 million. Uh, 98,000 for regulation and compliance and about 7.7 .7 million for intergovernmental and $1.7 million in taxes. That's where all of those varying revenue streams are coming from. The next item is our proposed budgeted expenses. So you'll see all of the different areas, what those expenditures for the, the 2025 year are, and you'll see that that total at the bottom is $42,572,645, which means we're balanced. We have a balanced budget, okay? Balanced budget without using any general fund balance or anything like that? No ARPA, no supplemental funds at all. This is just us being smarter, about the way that we're utilizing our dollars. Um, and so that's really exciting. And that shared revenue definitely helped as well. Uh, the expense type summary. So general government is general administration. Public safety is your sheriff, your ambulance service, your emergency government, animal control, and LEPC. Health and social services, that's Pine Valley, Health and Human Services, Child Support, and Veterans. Those are all in that category. Transportation, many of you know, some don't, that we own an airport. So that's our transportation. Highway administration. Again, um, bridge construction, town bridge cost shares, equipment, state maintenance agreement, highway system. Um, culture, libraries and the county fair. Those are the two pieces of culture that we as a county engage in. Uh, public areas. We have snowmobile trails, county parks, Ash Creek Community Forest, and the Simon Center. Uh, special education, we have our extension office. Natural resources um, has land conservation, wildlife damage management, nursery stock, recycling, and watershed. And really recycling is kind of rolled in the highway. But um, county planning. We have Southwest Regional Planning Commission that helps us with a lot of our projects around the county. Um, we have zoning and we have failing septic systems. Uh, county development, economic development. So we are setting aside a small amount of money each year towards economic development. Debt service, it's just what it says it is. It's the money that we owe for our debt service payments. And then capital projects, again, those are the 
the large scale projects that we do each year, those come before you during about May, June timeframe, and you approve all of those capital expenditures each year. The proposed budget expenses. So you'll see capital projects are about 1.7, 1.17 million. Again, with only borrowing $600,000, so that's pretty exciting. Our debt service, 3.351 million. County development, 37,500. County planning, 154,000. Natural resources, about 540,000. Special education, 202,000. Public areas, 622,000 roughly. Culture, about 380,000. Highways coming in right around 6.1 million. Transportation is about 36,000. Health and social services is about $21,000. Public safety is about 5.5 million. And general government is about 3.2 million. So again, that's where you're gonna see those expenses. The next slide shows a summary of our debt service what the balance remaining is, and when the maturity date is. So as you can see, um, we have one that will be falling off in March of 2025. That was a debt consolidation bond. We'll make the final payment of $245,000. We have another debt consolidation bond that will mature in March of 2027. The balance remaining there is $1,020,000. We have Capital improvement borrowing that was about 1.8 million dollars that matures in 2028, and then we don't see maturation until 2035, 2036, and 2038. Those two larger amounts, 7.9 million and a little over 7 million, almost 7.1 million, are both Pine Valley bonds. And then we have the radio tower project, which is again underway yet to be completed for a total of $26,220,000. And then on to the right there, you see what the total uh, debt payment is. You saw that in the slide prior, $3,351,488 annual is what we utilize to pay debt service. So gross levy, where are the largest expenditures by department? Um, you'll see the sheriff's office comes in at $4 million. Our debt service is about $3.4 million. Highways about 1.2. Institutional cost funds about 1.4. HHS. And I want to highlight this because there's a lot of misinformation surrounding how much of the levy HHS utilizes. Out of the $21 million that you saw in that whole big picture. Now, granted, that has Pine Valley. That has other items in it. But the large amount of services that are provided to our community cost $994,000, and that is astronomical. They do such a great job of generating those revenues, obtaining those reimbursements, and I think it's, it's a testament to the passion that they have for our citizens and for our community. Um, all other departments, you see a negative number here. Uh, Larry. That's the negative number is that we all those other departments that they get the general fund and those general funds actually receive revenues in excess of expenses. And those actually used to, when you're talking about such things, sales tax is included in that. Um, you're talking about the um, special assessments that are included in that. We're also talking about Pine Valley, Pine Valley's contribution back to us that is included in that. Our borrowing is included in that. So there's actually more revenues in that general fund than there is expenses. That actually subsidizes the rest of the funds that are not that are drawn off the levy. So if they didn't have that revenue in there, the levy would actually be higher. So administration is a great example. Administration, county administration will never make money. We have no way to generate revenue. But those areas that are generating revenue in excess of what they're spending, that goes into that general fund. And that continues to help fund all of the other operations that are happening within the county that don't have the ability to generate their own revenue. So that's what that number means. And that's why it looks like a negative because that's excess, uh, excess funds there. So 2025 pro proposed gross levy, and you'll see down at the bottom, 
ten million eight hundred seven thousand dollars nine hundred and twenty dollars and twenty three cents. That was twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty five levy ten million three hundred forty one thousand five dollars and seventy nine cents. So our proposed gross levy is actually down about four hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars this year. Okay. Our proposed net levy overall this year is about $6.7 million. So you're gonna see that this is a little bit different from the initial uh, proposed budget. And again, as I stated, you gave us some directives, you gave us some guidance on what you wanted included in this final budget. And so we did that. And so Larry is going to explain to you the next sheet and how that affected those overall proposed budget numbers. Okay, crucially, this sheet here, as you can see, just starts out with the preliminary budget and it goes over the proposed budget. And virtually, you can see the differences, it just goes right down the line, the budget to expenses. And you can see in the general government, the preliminary uh, budget was remain 266080. And then it, uh, the proposed budget was 3 million 272763, the difference of 6683. If you look at those differences, if we go down below with the reconciliation, we see where the preliminary budget is. It's 4 million, 42,474,103. You can see where the preliminary budget is. And then when we did the preliminary budgets, we added one sheriff deputy for 36,278. We added um, we moved up two departments, man conservation and feeds. We moved up two of those folks to 35 from 35 hours a week to 40 hours a week. They have been cut to 35 hours a week in the past. We have moved two departments this year to string two departments out of, I believe, six that were still on 35 hours a week. We moved two departments up, and that cost 33270 we took those funds, we took $71,000 out of the natural projects funds in order to pay for those. That comes out to our proposed budget, and our proposed budget is the $42,572,645. That difference of $1,468, that is the difference in estimated in the estimated shared revenue that we originally estimated, we originally estimated shared revenue at about 5% increase, and I think we were about $1,458 off, so we had to make that adjust in the budget. So that's the that other thing. I know that's a lot of numbers and a lot of reconciliation. Virtually, we just went from, we, we spent, we took about $70,000 of extra expenses, and we took all that extra expense out of, we had, we had about $300,000 that was sitting in capital projects, and we reduced that number from probably about 299000 that was sitting in capital projects. We moved that down to about 221000 to facilitate those two months. And when he's saying money that's sitting there, that was money that we had set aside in the budget this year. So rather than putting away $300,000, we're putting away a little less to fund these internally. And as you know, we're working on building up our capital project fund because historically we're having to borrow. If we can build this up and get it to a sustainable level, that way we won't have to borrow when we have capital projects. We'll have a fund that is continually being replenished and we can utilize those dollars within our budget. So that's the, the explanation there. That shows what those differences are. And again, the budget is balanced. Those numbers all match up. So with that, any questions on the budget? I wanted to know how the contingency fund was affected there. That went a little fast for me. Was there money taken out of that fund or money putting into that fund? There was no money taken out of the contingency fund. There was not? No. Did we carry a balance in the contingency fund? We do. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, though. Hundred and there's not very there's much not there. One hundred and twenty-five, roughly. Yeah. One hundred twenty-one thousand. Yeah, one hundred twenty-five thousand twenty-one. Around one hundred twenty-something, I believe. Yeah. Without memorizing the number. It's not a lot. Yeah, it's not a lot. Is that is that a normal amount or is that low for? Uh, we have an average over over a period of years on that contingency fund. We'd have to get that data. I don't know over the year. 
Yeah, I would say that we're doing a better job now anticipating a lot of things. So our reliance on that as a funding source has diminished over the last couple of years. We haven't used it. Yeah, no. we, we haven't. We haven't it. used it. No, Not haven't the last couple it. years. <laughs> haven't needed to. Those have been on the board for a while. Remember, we used to hit that for things fairly regular. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, Mr. Ten Cole. years ago, we made a resolution that we had to continue to carry at least three months. Yes, and that's a general fund balance. Yeah, basically our contingency fund. Why yeah. this good bookkeeping practice is carrying at least well, three months. Well, that's that's the general fund balance, but then we have a contingency fund as well. That is for those unexpected expenditures that we can utilize, you know, on a whim if we really need to. Okay. All right. Thank you. Point is, we're not for a week. No. Mr. McKee. Hey. What is the mill rate for the county share this year and what was it for this year and for 2000? I want to say last year it was 0.95 and this year is 0.7 something, but in, in essence, our levy, our allowable levy went down this year because the mill rate went down. The other thing that's significant, we reduced that short term borrowing, so there won't be as much county debt levy on people's property tax bills this year as there have been in the Correct. past. Correct. But yeah, it was kind of a kick in the pants to realize that our allowable levy amount went down because our net new construction is down, not up. So again, we're not growing. And that really does affect then what we can utilize um, to fund our operations. So. Is it the point point zero zero five two five point zero zero five two three? Sure. Yeah. Point zero zero five two five, and last year was point zero zero five eight two. Yeah. So, and an equalized value was um, um, a little higher this year as well. So, and not the official uh, namer of the mill rate. That's more of the treasurer thing. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I can tell you the equalized values were increased this year, which is going to affect that to a certain degree as well. Because everybody got reassessed, right? I think a large number of people did get reassessed. They didn't notice that value was um, a little different than it was a year before. So. Other questions? This is a public hearing, so the public can ask questions too. Question I have? Go ahead. Um, I'm just looking at the resolution. Um, that, your, that's next on our agenda. So, oh, I know what the question about. Okay, okay. Wait, wait, because it's about a dollar amount that's referred to. Right? What are the dollar amounts? It says one point five, and I'm wondering if that should be one point seven. That was the. That's just the sales tax. tax for, the, okay, but the, yeah, it did show one point seven. One on there just says taxes on the budget revenues. So it's taxes. Other besides sales tax, including taxes on. Oh, that should be one point. Yeah. It should be sales tax is one point five million. So that of oh, that yeah oh, that amount okay yeah. yes yeah. I can pull it up to see that's okay it just says okay. taxes so I want to make sure yeah. our number was correct so the one point five million is what is uh, used for the apportionment and then that's distributed out uh, as a credit if you will to municipalities based on their tit out value so um there could be some other things I can pull up the workbook if you want no that's okay, okay. I just want to make sure a number okay. right. yep very good thank you any other questions on the twenty twenty five Richland County budget. Hearing no questions, we will close the public hearing on the budget and move to the next item on our agenda, which is a resolution adopting the Richland County budget for 2025. I'll make that motion. Yeah, we haven't had the resolution read yet. Oh, yeah, But I'll give you the motion as soon as it's done, okay? <laughs> this will be resolution number 24-71. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that the 2025 budget includes revenues from the county sales tax in the estimated amount of 1.5 million. Be it further resolved that the sum of 10 million three hundred forty-one thousand dollars five three hundred forty-one thousand five dollars and seventy-nine cents be used in hereby as levied upon all taxable property in Richland County for county purposes for the year 2024. And be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passage and publication. This is being offered to you by the Finance and Standing. Finance and Executive Standing Committee on October 8th of 2024. Okay, now for the motion. Yes, Mr. McKee makes the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Supervisor Fleming. Any further discussion? 
commend all the county staff for their input in making this happen. It's our budget process has gone significantly smoother over the last couple of years than what we used to go through years ago. So thank you to everyone who puts effort into this and helps us understand it. We have them. Okay, we apparently have a typo. It says for the year 2024. Is that? Oh, should be year 2025. Okay, we'll correct that as a typo. So we have our motion and our second. All those in favor of adopting the county's 2025 budget say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Resolution is adopted. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to item 10 an ordinance relating to a parcel. Belonging to Al Vigneri in the town of Richland. This be ordinance number 24-17, amendment number 604 to the Richland County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance number 5. That the following described 2.14 acre parcel belonging to Al Vigneri in the town of Richland is hereby rezoned from A Forestry to Residential 1. You have the legal description there. This ordinance is being offered to you by the Natural Resources Department on October 7, 2024. Okay, looking for a motion on this ordinance. Motion by McKee, second by Gill. And discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathy Cooper. Um, basically, there's Al is selling that acreage to his a family member. They're going to build a house, and then uh, they're going to have to be residents there. And then they're going to, but, but the rest of the land is all still going to remain in agriculture. Any questions? Those in favor of the ordinance say aye. Aye. What opposed? This is adopted. Number 11, ordinance relating to a parcel belonging to Rowan Whipperforth in the town of Orion. This will be ordinance number 24 18, amendment number 605 to zoning ordinance number 5. The following described 23.66 acre parcel belonging to Rowan Whipperforth in the town of Orion is hereby rezoned. From a forestry to a residential district, you have the legal description there. Um, this ordinance is being offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee again on October 7 of 2024. We have a motion on this one. Motion by Mr. Cooey, second by Mr. Manning. And discussion, Kathy. Um, Rowan had sold some acreage to his grandparents, and that was in last month's. And to stop quit having these little remnant parcels left that are not zoned in the correct district. We are um, having them to zone his less than 35 acres from Ag Forestry to Ag Residential. Very good. Any questions on this one? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We adopted that ordinance. Number 12, an ordinance relating to a parcel belonging to Aaron Wallace in the town of Forest. This will be ordinance number 24 19, amendment number 606 to the zoning ordinance number 5. The following described 10.81 acre parcel belonging to Aaron Wilson in the town, Aaron Wallace in the town of Forest, is hereby rezoned from a forestry to a residential district. You have the legal description there. Again, this is being offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. Or the ordinance motion. Motion by Mr. Cosgrove, second by Mr. Cooey. Discussion. Um, Aaron and his wife are building, um, buying some land from the family. And um, or and the rest will remain agricultural land, egg forest land, but there's they need to be zoned to my forestry egg residential. Good. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. Adopted that ordinance. Uh, item number 13 on our agenda ordinance relating to a parcel belonging to David Bristol in the town of Dayton. This will be ordinance number 24-20, amendment number 607 to zoning ordinance number 5. The following described 0.946 acre parcel belonging to David Bristol in the town of Dayton is hereby rezoned from Egg Forestry to Residential 1. Legal description is listed there. This ordinance is offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. The ordinance, do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Cooey, second by Mr. Woodhouse. And discussion. Um, this one, there were... And actually, I'm sorry, Gary, I have to rely on you how this works. There was David and Echo Bristol own like two little parcels, and they're trying to. Neither you know, one was in the correct zoning district. And am I doing it right? My, his mother owned one, and when she died, he inherited one. Yep. And the other one, he had owned three. Yep, so they're 
Yeah. 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 Fixing an issue. Okay, we're, we're cleaning up the problem. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this one? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ordinance is adopted. Item 14, ordinance relating to a parcel belonging to Robert McConkey in the town of Richmond. This is ordinance number 24-21, amendment number 608, is only ordinance number, number 5, following described 10.38. Three eight acre parcel belonging to Robert McConkey in the town of Richland is rezoned from egg forestry to egg residential. Legal description is listed as follows. This ordinance is once again offered by the Natural Resource Sustaining Committee on October 7 of 2024. We have the ordinance. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Cooley, second by Mr. Manning. And discussion. Um there's a house on this parcel. It's actually the campground or the campground out there. And it's just like a, a cleanup thing again, just trying to. He was going to build something, so they had to clean it out. Okay. Anybody have a question on this one? If not, all those in favor of the ordinance say aye. 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 Opposed? We adopted that one. Item 15 an ordinance relating to a parcel belonging to Melvin Mishler in the town of Henrietta. This is ordinance number 24 2020, 22. Amendment number 609, the following described 2.04 acre parcel belonging to Melvin Mishler in the town of Forest is hereby rezoned uh, from egg forestry to residential. I believe that should have said town of Henry Edda. Kathy? It could be. I believe. Yes, it says that said. line. Okay, so that should say town of Henry Edda, not Forest. That is a typo. Okay. Um, is hereby rezoned from egg forestry to residential one. Legal descriptions listed. This is offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. Looking for a motion on this one. Motion by Manning, second by McKee. <laughs> Discussion. Um, this will be, uh, this one is they're selling off the residence, so that needs to be zoned a uh, is the acreage residential one. And the rest of it will be now be the next one. They'll be zoning it less than 35 acres. Remaining what's left, what he owns, it'll be that'll be going to the okay. yeah. So this is the first of two for this one. So I'll, any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. The ordinance is adopted. And now an ordinance relating to another parcel belonging to Melvin Mishler in the town of Henrietta. And this will be ordinance number 24-23, amendment number 610, zoning ordinance number five. With the following described 34.96 acre parcel belonging to Melvin Mishler, Mishler in the town of Henrietta. Fixing a typo again. Yeah. Is hereby rezoned from egg forestry to egg residential district. Legal description is listed as follows. And this ordinance is being offered again by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7th. Right. For a motion. Motion by Mr. Woodhouse, second by Supervisor Williamson. Kathy already explained this one to us. This is the remaining parcel getting its own properly for the size it is. Any further questions on this one? It's all in favor of the ordinance. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that ordinance is adopted. Item 17, a resolution approving the town of Ithaca's rezoning of a parcel belonging to John Herbst. Okay, this will be resolution number 24-72. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that in accordance with Wisconsin statute section 60.62 um, sub 3, that approval is hereby granted for the rezoning following described 7.77 acre parcel from the Farmland Preservation District to the Commercial District in accordance with the Town of Ithaca zoning ordinance. You have the legal description there. Be it further resolved that the zoning administrator shall submit a copy of this resolution to the known clerk of the town of Ithaca. Be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing publication. Once again, offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024, not 2023. Yeah. She approved the resolution. Uh, motion. Motion by Supervisor Kramer, second by Mr. McKee. And discussion? I'll take that. So I'm yes. Michelle Longshall, I'm the zoning administrator for Ithaca. Well, and this is um, a parcel that is being sold to um, Larry and Sherry Nelson and Lori Pizer. They're going to turn the whole German house into an Airbnb with hopes of adding a wedding venue as well. And so it's being zoned commercial. Um, so it just had to be done so they could with that. 
Yeah. Anybody have questions? You're in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. Thank you. Uh, item 18, a report on petitions for zoning amendments received since the last county board session. Will be two this next time. There will be two. And um, it's again, some of this cleanup. Okay. For those to the Natural Resources Committee and a report on petitions for uh, zoning received recommended for denial by the Natural Resources. None. We have none. Okay, very good. Thank you. That brings us to item 20, an ordinance approving an amendment to the Richland County Zoning Ordinance number five. Um, this will be ordinance number 24-24, an ordinance approving an amendment to Richland County Zoning, zoning Ordinance number five. The Richland County Board of Supervisors does hereby ordain in section 2C1B sub 3 of the Richland County Zoning Ordinance number five is, is amended to read as follows. Um, that the section three of that will list um, up to two farm residences. Be it further ordained, this ordinance shall be effective upon its passage and publication and is again offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. Great. The ordinance, we have a motion. I'll make a motion. Motion by Supervisor Fleming, second by Mr. Manning. And discussion on this change. The reason um, this change is brought forth is because there's, it, the, ordinance is, or the ordinance is silent on an egg force because they're coming. Farm, farm, farm residences can be put on there and then consult consultation with attorney window. We decided to because in theory they could have done a whole lot more. So we thought we'd clean this up and make it obvious what it's about. Good. Questions from the board? He has a question then all in favor of the, oh, yeah. yes, go ahead. Does that affect anybody in the county? We haven't had too many. We just had a couple people lately that they want to go up to the two, but they didn't know if there's any more that was allowed. And we just. I'm just curious, you know, the size of the farms are much bigger than they were at one time. Right. But that's that's on a parcel zone egg forestry. OK, so just egg forestry. OK. Yeah. So if they, you know, if they take a different parcel and it's 40 acres and they want to put it. I mean, that's. Yeah, understood. Because, you know, you see where I'm going. Yep, I do. Okay. Any other questions? Not all in favor of the ordinance say aye. 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 Opposed? This is adopted. Uh, item 21, a resolution setting the fee for certain rezoning. This will be resolution number 24-73. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Rizone County Board of Supervisors that the fee for the rezoning of parcels, which are not new land division, shall be set at $125. Be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing and publication. Is once again offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. Yes, we have a motion first to discuss. Motion by Mr. Gill, second by Supervisor Fleming. And discussion, we have a placeholder there for an ordinance. Yeah, so uh, the draft of this ordinance um, that's apparently what got uploaded. I would have to dig through and find unless Kathy, you know, off the top of your head, what the actual citation would be. Um, uh, no, I don't have but there is in the zoning ordinance a fee. He said it was um, and so we would be amending that. Uh, and either this could be postponed if you'd rather that citation be inserted prior to, or we can simply uh, move to amend to incorporate the proper citation. It's your pleasure. Kathy, when were you thinking of trying to put this in effect? As soon as we can. We've got a lot of people that what we're trying to do is as people come in to get a different a permit for a house, a building, a driveway permit. A sanitary permit. There's these little remnant parcels that are zoned incorrectly, yep. and we don't have to do anything besides. Well, they're being penalized because this was. Yeah, they got to pay the four hundred, the five hundred right. something bucks, five hundred, five hundred, five hundred fifty dollars yep. for it, and it's. We don't feel that. I mean, we don't know why those parcels exist the way they are. Now, if you're coming in and doing a new, that's different. But these, yes. we don't consider new because. We're wanting to try to clear up, clean up some of the remnant parcels. 
our intent here is to amend our county ordinance. It's just we don't have that specific ordinance listed yep. here, and we would have to fill that in later. And if we approve this the way it is now, alternative is simply take out everything between the commas. So, uh, rezoning and parcels which are not new land division shall be set at one hundred and twenty-five dollars because that that's in there somewhere. That would affect the same thing if, if anybody wanted to make that an amendment. Oh my God. Mr. Cooey proposes that amendment of striking the language between those two commas. So it will read, which are not a new land division shall be set at $125. Second. Second by Mr. Williamson. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor of the amendment to this resolution, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Now to consideration of the resolution as amended. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Our amended resolution is adopted. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 22, a resolution approving the Natural Resources Standing Committee applying for and accepting a lake monitoring and protection grant from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Okay, this will be resolution number 24-74. It will therefore be resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that approval is hereby granted the Land Conservation Committee to apply for a lake monitoring and protection grant from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in the amount of up to $8,560 to pay for staff time and supplies for aquatic invasive species projects in the county. Be further resolved that the Richland County Land Conservation Department will meet the financial obligations necessary to fully and satisfactorily complete the project and hereby authorize and empowers the following employees to submit the following documents to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for the financial assistance that may be available, you have a list um, there for you in the resolution. Be further resolved that there is no county match required for this grant and approval is hereby granted for the grant funds to be spent in accordance with the terms of the grant. And the county conservationist, Ms. Kathy Cooper, is hereby authorized to sign on behalf of the county any documents needed to carry out this resolution. Be further resolved that the applicant will comply with all local, state, and federal rules, regulations, and ordinances related to the project and the cost share agreement. And be a further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passage and publication. This is once again being offered to you by the Natural Resources Standing Committee on October 7 of 2024. Thank you. That was a mouthful. It's a lot. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Manning, second by Supervisor Fleming. I see Thanks. I have a typo in there. I have Land Conservation Committee and actually Natural Resources Committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll fix that as a typo. Mm -hmm. And this is like a grant we could apply for every year and we, as we spend the money, we uh, end the year we can send in reimbursement. And the grant has to be written this, the uh, resolution has to be written this day for the DNR. Yep. <laughs> Didn't sound like our words. <laughs> Any questions on this? Yes. Mr. Yeah, what does this thing do? Basically, we do things like we do clean boats, clean water. Education at the boat landings when we get a chance to there, we do a snapshot day. We went out to this year, we went out to the kayak landing uh, out um, off of 80 and we looked for, spent two hours looking for if there's any invasives we saw. Um, it's the signage at the boat landings, it's um, bait shop, talking to bait shop landowners. Um, it's education to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Yes. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. Do you do anything with Lee Lake at all? We haven't been up there yet for the clean boats, clean water. Um, we've been in consultation with DNR on that, and you know, I know there's been issues with the LG, but yeah. I, the only way you can do that is kind of chemical, maybe, and if it's going to control it or not, you know. And unless we want to chemically treat that whole lake, you know, we don't have. I don't think there's enough money here to do that. Beginning from the state, so that's something the village may have to apply for. It's owned by the village of the special grants. Do that. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Should have raised one opposition. And the resolution is adopted. Uh, item 23 reports from the county administrator on a short term borrowing, wage study update, and Tyler implementation update. Okay. I thought there was a short term borrowing piece in. Didn't you get a Short term borrowing, wage study update, and Tyler implementation. 
I thought that was in the packet. You know, sort of on the top. It was a chart. Um, at any rate, we applied for three different um, banks. So Larry put out to three local banks uh, for short-term borrowing. And that amount is not to exceed, as the prior resolution indicated, $601,200. And I was authorized to enter into and execute the agreement, but I didn't feel appropriate doing that before bringing it back to the committee or to the board, just so that you're aware of, of what that looked like. So Richland County Bank came back with an interest rate of 5.5%. Royal Bank came back with an interest rate of 5.45%. And Community First Bank came back with an interest rate of 4.49%. So we do plan to award the short term borrowing to community first bank, and we will be doing that after this board meeting is complete. We can get a call from community bank. Larry, how many banks did you put it out to? I put it out to those three banks. Yeah, so it was put out to those three banks. Any other questions on the short term borrowing? All right, so then additionally, um, we, as you know, we're in the wage study and we are in the uh, appeals phase now. So all of the new job descriptions, I would say all with the exception of maybe five or six that were either missed or um, need to be tweaked um, are done. They've been sent out to employees. Employees now have them in their hands. We had employee meetings uh, yesterday. We had meetings at 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. So Tessa Melvin was here. We also um, had WebEx access for all of those meetings and recorded the first meeting. Well, we recorded all of them, but we are going to post the new, the first meeting has been posted for employee access. Um, and that email has been sent out so that anyone that was unable to attend could watch that meeting. That meeting was the one with the most questions asked. So that's why we, we posted that. Um, what happens now is employees look over their job description. If there are things in there that they don't agree with or are unnecessary, they strike them. If there are things that they feel need to be represented uh, more accurately, they can note these on the form. So there's a form that went out to all employees today. They have until next Tuesday to complete them and return them to me. I will review them and then I scan them all in and I upload them and I send them to the employee, their supervisor and to Tessa Melvin so that any changes that are made, just like with the PAQs that they all did that determined their job description, all of those changes, all of those documents were returned to the employee along with the new job description. So it's completely transparent. They can see what was changed they can ask why it was changed if they're unhappy with it. Um, really good engagement yesterday. And again, as I said, last night, Tessa was here. She spoke to the executive committee about the 5% pool of money we have and the implementation. And we are on track to be able to, to do a lot of good with that, that pool of money. So I commend all of you for making this a priority. Um, because we are going to be able to ensure that we're paying our, our people a competitive wage. One of the things that I think will make everyone's hair kind of stand on end, we have 90 employees that are making under $20 an hour. And so that's our priority number one. Is that's 90 full-time employees. 90 full-time employees that are making under $20 an hour. So we are prioritizing ensuring that they are being paid a reasonable market wage. Now, if their market doesn't, put them at $20. We're not going to pay them $20. We'll pay them what the market dictates. But again, it's rectifying that it's moving towards oh, ensuring yeah. that we are competitive. So and then after that, each employee does get to see their placement on the scale and they get one last chance to appeal. Not because they don't like the money that they're getting, but because they really truly do feel that something is missing from the job description. So we're getting close to the end of this, and our hopes are to be able to implement then that first payroll 
in 2025. So very, very exciting um, and really looking forward to getting that done for our employees. Um, Tyler implementation. So as you all know, we're working towards getting this Tyler implementation done. There are a lot of employees dedicating some time to taking training, being in on a number of calls. Um, and Larry is the project manager on the Tyler implementation. So I'm going to let him speak to you about how those things are going. Um, right now on the Tyler project, we got the core group. I'll say the super users or the core group uh, gets in training. Um, we're doing module training and setup. Um, so that's right now we're doing that. We just had a data poll. So they pulled the data, the first data poll along with the first uh, report poll. So that means that they pulled personally took our data and it's going into their system and starting to set up our system with, with their system. Um, we have end user training will be starting soon. That means the guys that are actually, the guys that will be using the software, their training will be starting soon. We're still on track. Um, we're still set to be, it'll be in the first, just dipping in the Q2 of, of 2025, it looks like. We got uh, we got about nine payrolls, they're pretty complex. We're gonna try to get them down to one and get them all combined. So that's gonna take us a little a couple extra weeks. They wanna give us to try getting that all figured out. So that's gonna push it back probably into that Q, Q2 of 2025 for full implementation. So yes, our, our payroll, for any of you who, who uh, want a little bit of an education, come and watch payroll being processed because it is very antiquated and takes way more time than it should. So this is really exciting to be able to um, save so much staff time and energy and put a lot more of the responsibility on the employee to ensure that their, their time cards look correct and that everything gets submitted as it should. And we'll have workflow documentation. We'll be able to see if there's a hiccup in the process. We'll know exactly where it is and where we need to fix. So it's really, really great stuff. So um, with that, those are the end of my, my major updates for today. Questions for the administrator on these reports? I have a question. Yes, Mr. Brewer. So we'll no longer use the stand-up desk in your office do the payroll. <laughs> All right. That brings us to item 24 on the agenda resolution approving revisions to the Richland County Rules of the Board. And we have attorney Andy Phillips with us tonight who's been assisting us, assisted us with developing our set of rules that are currently in effect and also with looking at these revisions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With permission, can I sit in an open seat so I'm not Certainly. walking in the back of people's heads? Yes. Um, thank you uh, for having me back here at the meeting. It's great to see everybody again. As the chair mentioned, I assisted the county with the preparation of the board rules. And like every well-laid plan, we have revisions eight months after we got done with the board rules. And the revisions came about as a result of discussions that I've had with uh, board leadership your administrator, your county clerk, about some of the concerns that were occurring or that we were anticipating um, and how other counties have dealt with some of those concerns. And so they contacted me as counsel for the counties association and said, what are some other counties doing? How do they deal with some of these issues? And how do we best deal with the issues here in Richland County? And so I was tasked with preparing some draft rules and amendments to your rules to address some of those issues, and that's what's before you this evening. The rule amendments are broken down into four basic categories. And again, Mr. Chair, with permission, maybe we could take each category at a time so that mm -hmm. we could perhaps focus the discussion. The first section, and I believe it's within your materials, is new section 4.10 of the rules. And I know that right after new 4.10, I have a typo because there's old 4.10. Old 4.10 will be renumbered 4.11. And so new 4.10 deals with the concept of a board member's attendance at a closed session of a committee meeting when that board member is not a member of that committee. I think we know that Robert's Rules of Order have been adopted as the rules of procedure for Richland County Board and Committee proceedings. We also know that Robert's Rules of Order has a provision that allows for the exclusion of somebody from a committee meeting or a board meeting if they're not a member of that board or committee. 
And we also know that Wisconsin state statute says that you have to have a rule on the books in order to exclude a board member from a committee meeting if that board member is not a member of the committee. And so rather than relying upon incorporation by reference, we thought it best to place it right here in the board rules to establish expectations about when somebody may be excused from a closed session of a committee meeting if that person is not a member of the committee. The mechanism or procedure that we have put in these board rules says that it happens by majority vote of the committee. In other words, it's not one person who has control over the question of exclusion. It is a majority vote of the committee. That majority vote can be instigated by motion of a member of the committee or it can be uh, brought about by the chair of that particular committee. So either way is fine. Regardless, it takes a majority vote of the committee to exclude, exclude somebody from closed session if they're a board member and not a member of a particular committee. I don't know if there's anything, Mr. Chair, that I might have missed in the discussion. Yes. Or, what that does is it creates the, the expectation that a person is allowed to be unless they were specifically excluded by this vote. That's exactly right. And so you as a board member are entitled to be at open session and closed session of a committee meeting, even if you're not a member of the committee, unless the committee takes affirmative action by majority vote excluding you from that meeting. Mr. Chair. Yes. Andy, would you share some of the examples of why at times it doesn't make sense for everyone to be included? You shared some of those with us yesterday. So. In my experience as an attorney who's represented county governments across the state for about 30 years now, I've been in situations where a county board member has actively sued a county. And so it's impossible to get into closed session to have a discussion about that litigation if the opponent in the litigation is entitled to be in that closed session meeting. That's one example. Second is that the county at times deals with very sensitive personnel issues. And there's a reason to go into closed session to discuss personnel issues, whether it be somebody's reputation, their work history, their financial history, other issues that are incredibly confidential in terms of the character of the information. And so it's very important in my estimation, again, as an attorney that represents counties, that we maintain information and confidence and with as few people as possible having a right to that information is purely need to know. And so those are just a couple of circumstances where I have found it incredibly helpful to have a rule on the books establishing expectations about who can be in that closed session. Mr. McKee. We're only talking about closed session. Closed sessions of committees. Anybody can attend meeting. Just anybody can attend the meeting and, and this rule is that anybody who is a board member can attend the closed session too, unless it's specifically said by a majority vote that they're not allowed. Oh, okay. Other questions in this section, Mr. Brewer. Isn't, isn't though normally the chair of that committee in the, in the past and maybe that's why we're cleaning this up. Chair declares that I want so and so and so and so to stay. And, and, and we did ask Andy about that. The chair can list those and make that part of the motion to go into closed session. So there is a board vote on that. Uh, but I, I think you kind of answered your own question that, yeah, it's no longer just the chair saying this, it is the committee voting. So, how does this vote come about then? Um, Andy just talked about that a moment ago. Either somebody makes a motion to exclude a supervisor or the chair can say that the particular supervisor is excused. It's just in order to effectuate that supervisor being excused, it requires a majority vote. Something has to set it in motion, though. Correct. And Correct. I'm wondering what kind of language would be appropriate. It can either be part of the motion to go into closed session, or it could be a separate motion to exclude. I would think so. You, you need to set it in motion. Mm -hmm. Mr. McGuire. Do we have a list? Of, is the county in charge of a list of specific items that would that we can or cannot go into closed session about. In other words, we can't just say let's go into closed session for anything. We have to have we have to have an, an item list. There are statutory things. And Andy, maybe you can address that. Yeah, subject to your corporation counsel who's the expert on open meetings law for the county. Um, it's 19.85 sub one of the statutes which has 11 different reasons that you go into closed session. Um, in county uh, meetings typically I see it either for a 
quasi-judicial hearing. So you're taking evidence to make a decision as a result of that hearing, a personnel issue for competitive or bargaining reasons, when somebody's personal, financial, medical, or social history is going to be discussed, or when you're going to confer with legal counsel about a pending claim. Those are the reasons in statute. What is that statute number? 19.85, subsection 1. The reason why I, I, I said because I, I'm a big believer in a very simple statement here that should guide all of us, and that is we conduct a public business, and public business should be discussed in front of the public. That's my trip. That's what I have to say about it. It's generally very true, yes. Except for everything he just made. Yeah. 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 And, and were we to go into closed sessions for things that went on that list, we open ourselves up for trouble. Right. Other questions on this section? It, the next section is section 2.11. And the modifications to 2.11 are not tremendous, but it more or less amplifies and emphasizes the nature of the relationship between county board, county administrator, and county staff. And it encourages the utilization of the appropriate protocols both in terms of getting information as a board supervisor and also providing direction to administrator or staff. I think that the concepts in this mandatory language are already established within your board rules, They're already established within state statute. But I think, again, if we look at the purpose of board rules, and I can recall this discussion again eight, nine months ago when we started down the path of, of creating the board rules in the first place, it's to set expectations for the board and for the members of the board of supervisors. And so 2.11, again, the language here is to essentially clarify the nature of the relationship between the county board, the county administrator, and county staff. You can see the wording up there. Anybody have questions on this section? Okay, section 2.14. That's where we have significant amendments to the board rules. 2.14 is essentially what I would refer to as a code of conduct for board member actions and conduct during board committee mission meetings. This section was lifted in great part from a couple of different counties that have rules of conduct on their books. One of the counties I worked with extensively on their rules of conduct. And again, I don't think there's anything in these rules of conduct that are earth shattering or controversial. I think the expectations that are laid out here in the rules of conduct are pretty common sense. So again, the goal here is to provide a set of expectations for how board members will conduct themselves. Subsection A is a simple recitation of what I view to be global understandings of what it means to be a board member and how one conducts him or herself. Subsection B, if we scroll down, relates to, if I recall, board member conduct during meetings, whether it be a board meeting or a committee or commission meeting. Subsection C deals specifically with conduct outside of meetings. And then subsection D, again, has more of a global view toward board member conduct and the expectations. I'd like to make it very clear, we had a lot of discussion, we, me, board leadership, uh, and county administrator, about the distinction between rules of conduct and a code of ethics. And I think people just in normal conversation don't have a clear understanding of the distinction between those two concepts. You already have a code of ethics, you already have an ethics committee. That code of ethics and your ethics committee deal with defined standards of ethical conduct based primarily on 19.59 of the Wisconsin statutes. When the state defines ethical conduct in statutes, it's speaking to primarily financial conflicts of interest and potential for financial conflicts of interest. As you'll note in these rules of conduct, we're not dealing with financial conflicts of interest or potential financial conflicts of interest. We're dealing with rules of conduct. And so I don't want anybody to be confused about the purpose of this amendment to your board rules, it's not new ethical standards. You already have a code of ethics. You already have an ethics committee. These are rules of conduct governing your conduct as board supervisor, 
in meetings, whether it be board or uh, committee meetings, in relationships with staff, in relationships with the public, in those types of circumstances. You as the board police conduct under these standards. It's not an ethics issue. So I just wanted to make that clear from the outset that there is a significant distinction between a code of conduct like we see here and ethical standards that we see in ethics codes. As I mentioned before, other counties have established codes of conduct or rules of conduct that look very similar to the language that you have before you. I can tell you, and again, this is just my own observation, it has led to a greater level of decorum in board and committee meetings. And of course, we know in Robert's Rules of Order, they, they speak to this concept of decorum. What is that expected for decorum purposes at board and committee meetings? So I've seen rules of conduct like this be very helpful. So that's why they're here. I'll start back to you, Mr. Chair. Questions on this section? This one has a lot more stuff in it. What? Nothing. Okay, and then the final area is the new section 5.01 dealing with enforcement of the board rules. If we look at the new section 5.01, there is nothing in this section that doesn't already exist in terms of an enforcement mechanism for these board rules. It's just not spelled out in the board rules. So again, in order to establish expectations, we thought it best to lay out the process for enforcement of the board rules. If somebody is acting outside the boundaries of the expectations set forth in the board rules, what happens? And so there is a process here related to enforcement of these board rules. In subsection B, we see the potential remedies that are available if somebody violates the board rules. And they go all the way from a private meeting to a public censure, to a resolution censure, to a referral to the Executive and Finance Committee to see if cause exists to seek the removal of that board member from the board. I want to reiterate that this board does not have independent authority to remove somebody from office simply because they violate board rules. What I mean by that is chapter 17 of the statutes already contains a detailed process as to how somebody is removed from the county board. It can happen one of two ways, either they are recalled by the electorate or there is a removal by two thirds vote of this body based upon written verified charges filed by a taxpayer resident after a full due process hearing related to those charges. And so the referral to the executive and finance committee is only one step. The executive finance committee has no independent authority to remove somebody from this board either. So again, this doesn't create new process. The process already exists in state law, but having this process laid out in the board rules establishes the expectations for what happens if somebody acts, acts outside the boundaries that we establish here in the board rules. And then finally, I spoke earlier about the distinction between rules of conduct and ethics. There may be a situation where we have an ethical problem under our ethics ordinance or an ethical problem under the state ethics code for local government officials, 19.59 of the statutes. That also is a problem under these board rules. In that circumstance, the executive and finance committee has the authority to refer the matter over to your ethics committee and that referral in and of itself will be considered a complaint under your ethics code. Under your ethics code currently, your ordinance says that you have to have a written complaint from somebody in order to initiate the process of investigating and adjudicating an ethics violation. If we have a situation where the executive and finance committee makes that referral to the ethics committee, it is considered a complaint under your ethics ordinance. So again, maintaining the distinction between those two different situations. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Questions on this section? <laughs> Questions? Okay. And the overall goal here was not we're breaking new ground, it's to incorporate more specificity in some of the things that were there, but maybe not explicitly stated. Is that a fair assessment? That's a really fair assessment. I'm glad you point that out because I don't want anybody saying, oh, Andy, you missed this eight months ago. That's not what happened once a <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
I think that board rules, I've always said this, that they are a living, breathing document and they are not going to exist for 20 years without change. And if they are, that just means you're not paying attention to your board rules and how you operate. They're an evolution. And so I anticipate, fully anticipate, that in another year and a half, when a new board is seated, people might have different ideas about the board rules, and that's okay. You should have those rules conform to what you believe you ought to be doing here as a county board. So that's awesome. So you're right, Mr. Chair, these rules are not earth shattering, they're not groundbreaking, they already exist. But again, if we're going to establish expectations, let's put them in the board rules. And I think that's the goal. Before we proceed to the resolution to adopt these, any other questions on stuff we've talked about here? Mr. Manning. Make a motion. Oh, okay. Well, let's see if anybody else has questions first before we look into making the motion on the resolution. I don't see any. So, Mr. Clerk, if you'd read the resolution to adopt. Yes, this would be resolution number 24 75. Now, therefore, be resolved by the original county board of supervisors that approval is hereby granted to accept the proposed revisions and adopt the revised original county rules of the board. And be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon passage. This is being offered to you by the Executive and Finance Standing Committee yesterday, October 28th of 2024. So, you've heard the resolution. Mr. Manning, you wish to make a motion now. Okay, second. Second by Mr. Frank. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Frank. <laughs> Uh, you were online. No, 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 not oh, you were online. Were you on Instagram? It was at the beginning of it. You were. No. Okay. Excuse okay. Me. Sorry about no. that. No, we thought you responded to us when you said you yeah. Okay. okay. We'll correct that. Yes, that's why. I, he was not there. That's why I was chairing the kidney meetings. All right. Any other discussion before we vote? All those in favor of adopting these amended board rules, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? One vote opposed. Was that mm -hmm. yeah. Supervisor Hendricks and Supervisor Miller? So two in opposition. Sure. Okay. I was at that meeting. You were. That was, okay. Was me too. Oh, that was you. That was me. Okay. What else bad did you say about? Oh, okay. Wait a minute. We will clear that up. <laughs> I will. I'm supportive. Uh, Miller, right? Because right. 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 and Miller in opposition. Got it. Okay. Uh, with the two votes in opposition, the resolution is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. And, everybody and uh, thanks as well to the Wisconsin Counties Association. Andy's time was being billed to them for assisting us with this. Uh, WCA has been able to take his experience in working with us. They recently released a template of county board rules for every other county to use that were based largely on what Andy developed with us uh, earlier this year. So, All right, we will continue on our agenda. Uh, we are skipping item 25. We'll put that off till next month. So that brings us to item 26. An ordinance adopting and enacting a new code of ordinances for Richland County, a very exciting ordinance. Yeah, so are we ready? Yes. So for those of you that have been around for a little while, this whole codification of ordinances is not a new project, right? So just to give you a summary of kind of how this has happened, I went through the my pile of stuff back here. And this codification process actually started on January 18th of 2022 when we approved the adoption of resolution number 22-9, which was to take our current ordinances and have them codified into a codified code of ordinances. So a review of that process, since this has been a bit of time since we started, um, upon approval, all existing ordinances were scanned and sent to the vendor. Uh, the vendor was then called Municode, they're now called Civic Plus, so we've They've had a little merger in the process, but for those of you that have been up in my office, you've probably seen the ginormous ordinance books, right, that are um, rather old and uh, rather antiquated. So nonetheless, um, I cannot take credit for scanning all of those items. Miranda scanned all of those items, which was a feat in itself to get them scanned one, but then second to the vendor to then dissect and put together in a real codified code of ordinances. So after we sent those out, um, they sent us a code organization plan um, that Attorney Wendell and I reviewed around March 1st of 2023. There was a bit of a delay from when we sent the original items to when the items started to move through. The message from the vendor was that they had 
um, underestimated the amount of time a project like this takes. There were still some other COVID situations going on that delayed a, a few things in between there. So nonetheless, um, we received our first draft manuscript on July 18th of 2023, and that was this thing here. So I show you this because if you've been to my office to see those books, those ordinance books, they're like 25 million times the size of this. So they were able to take our ordinances and codify them into just this manual that you have here. Um, this document, also known as the manuscript, was then reviewed by myself, Administrator Pesh, and Attorney Window. We took this, went through each of the sections, the newly uh, created sections, and then divided that out to all department heads. This was given, there was a three step review process that went from August 24th of 2023 through October 6th of 2023. The finalized documents once reviewed by all applicable departments were then sent off to, um, I call them Unico Pacific Plus to have um, the all those changes, any changes reviewed and put into this that you see here. So fast forwarding to October 1 of 2024, we received this, which is all of our ordinances. These binders are touchy, so you can look later, but all of our ordinance codified into all right, um, a real uh, code of ordinances that once approved will be then placed online. So the thing I want to mention is the ordinance that ordinances that we had did not change. So when you're adopting this ordinance, you're not adopting a whole new set of laws. These are ones that we already had as a county. They just put them into a more user friendly format. And the only other change that was done was general. They did gender neutralization. Throughout, and I believe they may have um, taken a few things that were no longer relevant. There was a code attorney that did this in, in you know, conjunction with our own corporation counsel. So what you have before you then is um, a code of ordinances that will be available online. Um, I don't know. I think there'll be a link to our website to them to then host it for us. This code will then be updated on an, uh, well, a quarterly basis. Um, but nonetheless, we'll have a printed, a new copy printed every year, but then it will be updated and is a live living document that is now accessible on this thing called the internet, which right now it's not. You have to come to my office and dig through these binders. So um, this may seem like a little bit of a project. But this is one never been done before. It was also one of our strategic goals back um, in 2021 was one of the first ones we started. So I didn't realize it was going to take years, plural, to do that. I thought it was going to be six to eight months, but nonetheless, we got here and here we are today. So I don't know if you want to give any other information about codification in general, but our ordinances will now be online and searchable. Um, they will continually be updated along with this. We also did um, have some other document storage um, uh, capabilities that will make resolutions and other things also a little easier to search online as well. So the ordinance you have before you, I won't read all of that, but Literally, um, the top part explains that we're just adopting and enacting a new code of ordinances for Richland County. It'll provide the repeal of certain ordinances not included therein. It'll provide a penalty for the violation thereof, providing for the banner of amending such code, and then providing when such code in this ordinance shall become effective. So that is, um, again, what you have before you as an ordinance. We, upon approval by you guys, will have um, an adopted code of ordinances, codified code of ordinances. Move to approve. Motion by Mr. Carroll, second by Supervisor Glassbrenner, and discussion. Please. Mr. Frank. Go ahead. Sorry. Will this allow us to talk to uh, all of our municipalities and city of Richland Center? The code will be opened up and online for any member of the public to view. So, in other words, as a resident of the town of Rockbridge, I'm concerned about dog licensing. Yes. That's that's a very common thing to search is like dog licenses because everyone has issues with dogs running loose, right? Um, that's why we have Fund 81 since Chapter 81 statute. So this will address the county's um, ordinances on that, but then also be accessible for anyone to search. So, so again, it's not new ordinances; they're taking what we had and revising them. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Frank. Thank you. So um, later on in today's meeting, there are two ordinances that we're trying to get through. Um, are those going to be numbered into this? Right. So, or do they create their own number until every three months it's reviewed? At this point, we can approve these ordinances as we've so throughout the process. Every time we've had like a zoning ordinance amendment, right? There's several of those. I send those off to the vendor, and then they've been codifying those up until August. They actually stopped in August because that's when the final draft was being ready to be submitted. So. 
Upon a new ordinance being adopted, there's going to be that process is going to be a little different. There'll be more of an official form. We'll send that off to them, then they codify it into the section of code that it's applicable. Maybe assign a new number or subsection or what have you. Okay. So my next question then is is this code of ordinances going to be the the ordinance? Because chapter 16 is not correct. So chapter 16 is, uh, I believe that's kind of related to ordinance 89-7 that we've yes. been working on. We've, we've discussed this at length, um, how that will be incorporated into the new, new code, knowing that some of these things were already in progress or not quite worked out to the point where this was submitted to move the process along. So, so my, my concern is that if this goes out online, this is not correct. And we are working on the corrections and repairs Correct. Updates 2897. So, so any, anyone looking at this is going to go, oh, the sheriff's department has two task force officers. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, until those revisions are formally passed, then what's on the books is, is the ordinance that stands. But those revisions have been passed um, through amendments to 897. Task force officers were taken out eight, ten years ago. They are no longer, and it is listed here. As task force officers, they are no longer part. The number of officers listed is not correct. One short. So that was maybe an oversight. So I, I believe there was some of that discussion too was what should be codified and what shouldn't in terms of like a process versus a, a code of ordinance as a as an ordinance versus just a I don't want to say just a but a policy of sorts. So I think there was discussion about what should be codified and what shouldn't be codified. Correct. But what I'm saying is, you know, as this was reviewed, it may be very well that a department had missed something and didn't strike something out or, you know, so that should have been corrected. So if there are those items that you see that are incorrect, we just need to know about them to make sure that they are corrected. So, but if we adopt these today, these are the rule of ordinance. And they are not right. Right. I think so, that's the problem, so, especially the number of items that are not correct from 897 that that are totally missing from this document. Is there a way to can I make an amendment to bring 897 back into this while we're doing this process and then get that corrected? Otherwise, the sheriff has some different authorities here. Um, just reading this one, task force deputy, the holder of this position must be deputized by the sheriff. There is no such position. Can we bring that 89.7, drop it in here, or at least say that this one's being revised. Can we put that, hey, this section is being revised, because 89.7 is, is a big piece along with the hiring process. I mean, we're, there's a lot of work going on. How do we make that so this is not? We need to coordinate with the vendor. Sorry. Right. For the So I, I would, I guess I would, if it's possible, go ahead and pass the, the code of ordinances except 16. 16 as it is under 89.7 until we finish that process, which hopefully only be a few weeks or a few months. We're close, we're really yeah. close. But uh, I think there's some real position gaps here that would be very misinformation to the public. So is that stuff that needs to be taught, should be codified or no? Well, the number of positions does have to be set by the board. And it's incorrect. And it sounds like there maybe was action taken by the board that was not incorporated by meeting code. I, I don't know. Probably. Or, or, or I believe that some of that, some of those items were stricken from. So, so that draft, that 16 draft, which is in this manuscript was provided to department heads to review. So my thought is that department heads when they were reviewing this then we're also given a form to list any updates changes you know what have you on there so then that information was provided to me i could look back and see if the what the department had noted on there because my guess is that perhaps that was missed when the department had did the review in fact i believe this may have been a place back there so i guess my understanding with all this is we've been actively working on 89-7 for Yes. For a year yes. now. Yes. And so my understanding, and I'm going back to, well, I said going back a year, I thought that that was what was going to be incorporated in the new codification. So, I mean, I, I spoke with Derek 
last week about yeah. this because it hit me that, I mean, 95% of 89-7 is gone in Chapter 16. So I, I kind of look at that. That's part of my digits for the road I drive on and how I run the office. You know, I have the Constitution, state and U.S. Constitution. I've got laws and stuff like that, and I have this ordinances. And so, like, you know, like I talked to Bob, I'm not worried about myself. Like, it's going to keep operating how I've been operating. But if it weren't me, and this is what is in what is down the road, you may have an issue. Mr. Carroll. Um, maybe a more general question then is, does, does the vendor have some other quicker way to incorporate changes in, rather than this quarterly thing, even if it costs more? No, I mean, I, I can send them. I can send the changes as soon as they're approved and, and they can, I'm not saying the changes aren't, they typically make them quarterly and then display those, you know, have those out live, if you will. I mean, I can send them to them and see if they can be um, incorporated in there before, but, um, you know, I don't know how quick that turnaround time is because we haven't adopted the code and gone through that process. That's my question. So let's find out if they have a quicker way to do this. So my thought is that we, I mean, is, is 89-7 going to be finished then at some point? Because I know it has been kind of carried through several different agendas and we've, we've had this conversation. And if it's going to be passed, then my thought for right now then would be to not adopt this code of ordinances yet, I guess we can continue to use what we have. It's not like we don't have any ordinances, but if 89-7 is going to continue to carry on at some point, the amendment has to be approved. And it just, it's, it was a, you know, two things going on at the same time. So that would be my only concern is that then this is three more months before it's adopted. And then this code is sitting here and we're trying to move forward with that so that would be my thought i thank you for that comment because that is exactly my concern too that this goes on and yeah. on and on um, recently um attorney wendell and the sheriff and i sat down and sorted out the details of that it is our it was our hope to have them at the november county board or at the november public safety meeting okay. um that will be a time to review it but not approve it we plan to approve it in the december meeting so we're we're an end in sight. What's that? For 89-7. For 89-7, complete rewrite, uh, partially into policy and partially into. But there's also, so we wouldn't need to, to hold up this codification if it were just for the revisions of 89.7, because revisions to existing ordinances is exactly how this whole process is supposed to work. So we would just go through our revisions, finalize them, bring it to the board, and then submit them to the vendor but you're saying that there are the, the chapter 16 that is in that code Correct. does not reflect even the current current nine seven not not any proposed revisions or anything Correct. like that but as of eight current. or ten years ago right. so if we can correct that then we can still move forward with codification because again revision of, of ordinance is what this body does um and so it's not uncommon for for them to be in process um, and, and again i have no trouble with and everything else but 16 i just don't want 16 going out to the public and seeing the errors in it and having a problem with that so if everything else is good that'd be great if it, if it takes a motion to do that that everything goes up at 16 so be it we'll clean up 16. i'm not sure the best way to handle it i don't know how they can uh, not only do part of it and not all of them it's can they leave can they leave chapter 16 to be updated i have no idea i, I don't know I, either. if it had the conversation with the vendor bob i don't Right. I, can we do that? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, they don't know. They might have this was a complete package, so I don't know. Or could they just flag the current language and say this is under active revision? So what sure. is it? Your Something so that it's not. I don't know. They, uh, Either way, I feel like we're going to now have to table this. Yeah, I, I, I think so, because I would rather have the code finalized and fully adopted. And then I guess this is I guess this sends a message to after the third review that all department heads, you now have a fourth and fifth time to review this code again. Um, I can provide the sheets for updates that I provided the last three times. So I'll, I'll send those out and, and then hopefully we can catch any last ones with the, the full push. So we waited this long, I guess, a few more months to get it right the first time. Is it my, my apologies for throwing the tailspin on this, but I think it's important. Are we looking for motion to postpone? Make the motion to postpone. Postpone. We want to say till time certain or just till we're ready. Time certain. 
Okay, so definitely at this point, point we'll bring it back. Okay, so motion to postpone by Mr. Brewer, second by Mr. McKee. Uh, all those in favor of postponing this till we can bring it back with the proper corrections, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that's what we'll do. We'll get it right. I appreciate that, team. All right, so here, then we need to go to item number 27 on our agenda resolution accepting donations to the Simons Recreation Complex. This will be resolution number 24 76. Now, therefore, be resolved by the original county board of supervisors that approval to accept the above donations from the Simons. Foundation is granted. Be further resolved that this resolution is effective upon passing publication. This is being offered to you by the Executive and Finance Standing Committee on October 28th of 2024. The resolution. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Gill, second by Supervisor Glassbrenner. And for discussion. Thank you. Uh, no, yeah, I just uh, get along again. Just don't want to go with much of your time here, but um, just want to thank the, uh, the Simons Foundation. Their goal was to um, contribute uh, around fifty thousand dollars a year to help make uh, Simon's more sustainable facility. Uh, with this um, approval tonight, this will get them right at fifty thousand dollars for the year. We've also got some other things we're working on that might get in yet this year, early next year. Um, but this is uh, a big, uh, a big statement from them, I guess, just in their support, in our member support, and our donor support uh, that is helping to uh, reduce the levy impact of Simon's, but improve the facility. Uh, for our residents as well. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Any questions from the board on these donations? Mr. Chair, same changes as the last one. Yes, Mr. Frank, as opposed to Mr. Wilkinson. Frank. <laughs> Any other questions? All those in favor of accepting these donations, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you to the foundation and thank you. Uh, item 28, an ordinance prohibiting persons from engaging in obstreperous behavior with a motor vehicle. This will be ordinance number 24-26, um, disorderly conduct with motor, motor vehicle summary. Um, and as Chair Turk just noted the title of it there, I won't read the ordinance for you um, in its entirety, but um, the county may issue a citation for a disorderly conduct with motor vehicle to an individual if he or she engages in the following behavior, you have your behavior listed there. The minimum and maximum penalty for this citation shall be consistent with the original county forfeiture penalty structure. And this is being offered to you by the Public Safety Standing Committee on October 4 of 2024. Read the ordinance. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Manning, second by Mr. Cosgrove. Getting a quiz us on what obstructors. Yeah. <laughs> I had to ask before the meeting, so I did not know, but our, our corp council was able to locate that definition for us. Noisy and difficult to control. Yeah. Mr. McKee. Um, it says motor vehicle. Yes. To me, that can mean a car, a truck. There are specific definitions of motor vehicles in Wisconsin statutes that we would rely on in determining uh, whether or not something counts as a motor vehicle. Other questions? I can't imagine this ordinance hasn't been there. I swear I was ticketed under this ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the city has a, an equivalent um, kind of called, uh, uh, what did I just say? Unnecessary display of power, a display of power. Um, but uh, T.A. Harper did bring these forward and indicated that they were a tool that she did not currently have. Um, and so I asked that they, they be reviewed as a possibility. Any other question? <laughs> so those in favor of the ordinance, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? It's adopted. Uh, item 29, an ordinance prohibiting persons from acting contemptuously with respect to the circuit court. Okay, this will be ordinance number 24-27. The county may issue a citation charging an individual with contempt of court if he or she engages in any of the following. So you have A through D listed there for behavior. 
And once again, the minimum minimum and maximum penalty for the citation shall be consistent with the Richland County forfeiture penalty structure, and is again offered by the Public Safety Standing Committee on October 4, 2024. Motion from Passgrove to this ordinance. Second from Supervisor Kramer. Any questions, Mr. Caro? Sounds great, but how in the world do we not already have this? <laughs> well, I would assume there is like a felony contempt of court. If they there is. That. But this is an ordinance. Yes. Um, if you'll indulge me geeking out a minute. Um, so what we have on the statute, there is contempt of court in the civil context. So um, I saw it a lot in family law. I had clients who would want me to go after the other parent because they did this or didn't do that, the other thing. Um, and that is a, a civil action. There is criminal contempt of court. Um, the most familiar people might be would be bail jumping. So you're released from jail on certain conditions, you violate that condition, that is contempt of a court order. You were ordered to do something by the court, you did it anyway, um, and you violated it. Our ordinances are occupy a, a little niche in between the two. So there's purely civil matters, there's criminal matters, and then there's ordinance violations. Those are civil, but they parallel the criminal uh, procedural track. So every Tuesday, uh, every other Tuesday, I sit on the city side, Amy sits on the county side, and we go through and we do all the speeding tickets and disorderly conduct tickets. Um, when people talk about tickets, this is usually what they're talking about. Um, they're, so long as you pay the forfeiture prescribed by an ordinance, there is no possibility of imprisonment. Uh, and that would be one of the major differences. You also don't get like a criminal record, although the uh, Ordinance violations are tracked in CCAP, um, but that would be why this hadn't existed previously is because that basically exactly that people assumed it did. Um, and it, it found DA Harper again uh, indicated that it, it's a tool that she might be. It, she may wish to use that in negotiations rather than penalizing someone further with the only option uh, being a, a felony contempt having this as a, an opportunity for them to make, make a, a financial forfeiture instead. Similar tool, but different size. Yeah. Other questions? Not all those in favor of adopting this ordinance say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? This is adopted. Thank you. Item 30, a resolution approving the purchase and implementation of Microsoft Office 365. Speed resolution number 24-77. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that approval is hereby granted for the purchase of Office 365 licensing from CWG in the amount of $69,435.66 and the implementation to be performed by Bose Allen at a cost not to exceed $42,625 for a total cost not to exceed $112,060.66 be it further resolved that the funds to carry out this resolution shall come from the following sources, $66,000 from ARPA funds, from Health and Human Services, and $46,060.66 from the remaining 2022 MIS CIP budget. Be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective upon its past and publication is being offered to you by the Executive and Finance Standing Committee on October 8th, 2023. For the resolution, motion by Supervisor Harwick, second by Mr. Brewer. In discussion. Online yeah, I, I'm online. There she is. Hi, Barb. Mm -hmm. Good evening. We got to get you turned up here in the room, Barb. Just a second. <laughs> there we now? go. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, Office 365 is something we've been uh, excited to do for a long time. It's going to get us a lot more tools in our toolbox and help with the security for the uh, network of the county because our uh, email will now be hosted in the cloud. Uh, we're really excited about moving forward on this and we have a good opportunity using some ARPA funds that are going to uh, expire if we don't use them. So this is a great time to do this and I'm hoping that you all have good support for this. It will also give all of you who have iPads the opportunity to put Excel, Word, and the office suite onto your iPads. I'd like to add that this will 
give every single county employee, with the exception of a very, very few, a county email address, which we do not have now and has been problematic. So this is very exciting on that front as well. Do you have any questions on this? Mr. McKee. Is there annual charge to that? Or is it one up front charge? No, there is an annual um, expense that is about the 69,000. Um, we're working on a couple of different avenues to cover some of that licensing. A lot of the departments that have um, funding to reimburse, that is a reimbursable cost. So any of the state funding ones, those are reimbursable costs. And it will have to then be a part of our ongoing budgeting to incur Make sure these covered yeah. costs are covered. Okay. Yes. Mr. Woodhouse. Are there uh, additional cost savings or assets to be uh, sunsetted with this implementation? At this time, there, there may be. Um, it will take about a year and a half to implement all of those. So I hate to say yes, because you're not going to realize those costs. Immediately, um, we had hoped for more than what we're seeing, uh, and it's possible that we will, but some of the security, some of the encryption and those types of things that we pay for separately, we're hoping not to have to pay. So there are some offsets. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing any, so all in favor of this resolution signify by saying aye. Anyone opposed? Resolution is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to item number 31 a resolution relating to an already obtained snowmobile alliance grant accessible to counties for snowmobile bridge replacement. This will be resolution number 24 78. 78. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that approval is hereby granted to complete the project as defined. Submit for re reimbursement once all work is completed. Be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing publication. This being offered to you by the Public Works Standing Committee on October 3 of 2024. Chief the resolution. We have a motion. Motion by Mr. Cosgrove. Second by Mr. Frank. In discussion. Gosh. Uh, fairly standard procedure as the snowmobile club said the bridge has become an obsolete. This one case was already designated to be replaced. The one that we plus we had earlier this year it really devastates that bridge. Uh, they go all we get bids for a new bridge. It's 100 paid for by the DNR. It's full cost to the county, but we have to facilitate the actual replacement of the bridge. Free cut and dry procedure. Any questions? Questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Adopted that resolution. Thank you. Item 32, a resolution approving the sheriff's office to sell surplus firearms to current certified law enforcement staff of the office. This will be resolution number 24-79. Now, therefore, be resolved by the original county board of supervisors that approval is hereby granted for the sheriff's office to sell surplus firearms to current members of the sheriff's office staff. Be further resolved that the proceeds from the sale of surplus firearms shall be deposited into the sheriff's new equipment line in order to help purchase replacement equipment. Be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing publication is being offered to you by the Public Safety Standing Committee on October 4, 2024. Thank you. Heard the resolution. Do we have a motion? Motion by Cosgrove, second by Glassbrenner. I have a question on this. It says in the title to current certified law enforcement staff, but that's not in the body of the resolution language. It just says sheriff's office staff. The intent is to be certified law enforcement officers. Okay. Do we need an amendment to make motion to amend? Okay, so we would need a motion to add that amendment. Motion by Mr. McKee, second by Mr. Frank to amend it by clarifying that it is certified law enforcement staff we're talking about. Any further discussion on that amendment? Is that Why? only your office or um, not, not the guys over in the city? No, okay. it'll be certified law enforcement okay. staff of the okay. Sheriff's Office. Well, certified law enforcement officer. Yep. Discussion on the amendment? 
All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so considering the resolution as amended, discussion. Shapiro. Are these obsolete? I mean, what, why are they surplus? So we, I've been, I've been working on replacing them in the course of, it's been a little over a year now. Uh, so I've replaced a number of them. And so I've just been putting the old ones in the safe as I go along. Um, so uh, I'm replacing them just because they're, they're quite old. They're kind of all over 20 years old now. Uh, so, but yeah, they're right now they're just taking up space in the safe. I figured I could free up that space. Do you also have to go through a FFL or F a license dealer to do this, or can you just sell it to an officer? How does that work? So I can sell it to the officers. The plan as of right now is there's actually an ATF form that I can record the transaction on, and we'll just maintain that as a price. Yep. Yeah. Other questions. All those in favor of the resolution as amended, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Resolution's adopted. Thank you. Uh, item number 33, resolution approving the payment for a new canine and required training from donated funds. This will be resolution number 24 dash. Now, therefore, be resolved by the original county board of supervisors that approval is hereby granted for the public safety standing committee and the sheriff to pay Von Leach Kennels Inc. Um, in the amount of $20,325, be further resolved that the total cost of carrying out this resolution in the amount shall be paid from the Bridgestone County Canine Fund, and be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing publication. This is being offered to you by the Public Safety Standing Committee on October 4, 2024. The resolution, we have a motion. Motion by Supervisor Kramer, second by Supervisor Harwick. Discussion. Getting a new canine. We have a new canine. We have a new yes. We're paying for a new canine. Yes, yes we're paying for the new canine. So, uh, actually, a canine raven, so it's Sergeant Isaac Gerber, and canine raven actually started only last week. They just completed training and their first shift together was last week. So, uh, they're actually on duty tonight. Uh, I guess they can't get me here by the end of the training. But uh, they are on duty tonight and they've been for us for weeks. Um, so the, the funds are all donated funds. Um, so when you look at the Richmond County Canine Fund, um, it's built up and basically the public pays for this, right? Well, they pay taxes, but this isn't tax money. This is all donation. So, Mr. Gill. How does the canine provide assistance? What kind of, how does that help? Um, so both of our canines are what we consider dual purpose canine. So they're trained in, in apprehension, tracking, apprehension and drug uh, drug location so um they uh, we love using to look for people whether it's people we want for arrest purposes or it's just somebody who's lost um we can use them to search for people we can use them to search for articles somebody lost their cell phone out in the uh, we could actually use them to look for like that um, that's okay you know do you tie up a canine for something like that maybe not but it is a possibility um and then Locating drugs. Um, yeah, article searching, finding people, finding drugs. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes at a traffic stop, they'll have the canine go around the vehicle and the sniff, correct? Yes. Yep. Other questions? If there are no other questions, then all in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, item 34 resolution approving termination of current billing contract with emsmc this will be resolution number 24-81 now therefore be resolved by the original county board of supervisors that approval um, is hereby authorized for the termination of emsmc ambulance contract be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective upon its passing publication the resolution resolution is being offered to you by the executive and finance standing committee at their uh, September 10, 2024 meeting. The resolution. Good motion, please. By Mr. Gill, second by Mr. Manning. Um, so we got discussion on this. Um, I'll take it uh, okay. as Mike is unfortunately not feeling well. Um, so 
as you many of you know, the primary source of funding for the ambulance service is billing. It's billing for calls. It's getting those reimbursements for calls that they go on from insurances, Medicare, Medicaid, all of those very things. In order to facilitate that billing and those collections, um, there is a contacted provider because obviously our ambulance service staff does not have time to be doing it on their own. And so about a year ago, we switched providers because we were having issues with the current provider at that time falling behind, not um, keeping up with our reimbursements and our billings. Um, and to this date, I don't think we've still seen all of the money from that biller. And so there was a contract approved to transition to EMSMC, which has been providing that service now since last year. Again, a couple of months ago, when uh, Director Jessen came about, we were noticing some, some lapses in revenues and decreases, and that was alarming. He dug in and he started making phone calls and realized that there had been a number of days where no billing had been done. They were not processing anything. It was sent to them. They weren't doing their job. And the other interesting piece with this company was that they also operate a collection agency. So how hard are they going to try to go out and get the funds that are owed to them when they can charge us more money and try to put them into collections? So he did work with um, some account specialists there. They apologized up and down. No, we're going to do better. We're going to fix this. Um, but really have not seen that increase in those revenues. Still a lot that is backdated in August. We did get a significant amount of those reimbursements in, which was encouraging, but again, it's still a struggle. And he did find another provider that offers a lot more benefit um, and has agreed to uh, start providing services for us on January 1st with a the same cost as we were paying for ESMC. So um, with that, and I know you probably have more questions that, than that that I can't answer, but that's the gist of what has gone on. Attorney Wendell has been involved. So there are, if you have any more technical questions, he may be able to answer those. Any questions from the board? Yes, Mr. We're, we're, we're multiple uh, billing agencies contacted. Just out for bid was this. So uh, how did we land on this recommendation? Mike researched it. He reached out to another uh, a number of different services. Um, I can't recall how many off the top of my head, but um, it, it, this was not pursued lightly. Um, we did give EMS MC a, a chance to um, turn things around, and it was ultimately decided that any improvement was because of the increased scrutiny uh, rather than any sustainable change in, in service. So, um, yeah, I know that he spoke with a number of departments who were very um, positive about the, the new service that we're looking to engage with. Um, and I think the, the defining characteristic of the new service is that it was founded by former EMTs. And so that it, there's um, like an inventory management system and everything that's involved um, and presumably it's geared towards the people who do that in and out every day. So hopefully third time's the charm here. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he was aware of the failings of, of the CV1 and then, um, you know, saw firsthand the failings of the MSMC. Um, and so I, I don't think he jumped into this new proposal. Sure. Thank you. Um, it says current billing contract. Do you know when the contract is done? January 19th. Okay, yep. so we won't get uh, analyzed. No, anymore. no, we, we elected to pursue just a uh, uh, notice of non renewal. Okay. Um, rather than trying to terminate it. Thank you. Mr. McKee. What <laughs> happens if. They just have a bunch of buildings that they have a process. We go to the new company. Does that get switched over to the new company? They have said that they will go back and um, 
if they say audit or basically review all of those, you know, the hard part is from, from what I understand, there are certain timings on certain bills. So you, once they're submitted, you only have so long to, to process and pay and all of that. And then after that, you really can't go after them for those dollars, but they're going to go back through, they're going to look at those things and they're going to rebuild, if you will, those items that they can. So, which is good. And they're going to go back through and look at, I think the past, there's a, there's a pretty significant period of time. I, I would want to say a year, but I don't know that it's that long. They're going to go back through and they're going to look at it and try to see if there's any way that they can get maximize those dollars to try to get payments for some of those things, which is also wonderful. Um, and this service, as Mike said, it, it has a lot of other modules that go with it. There's a scheduling module, the inventory management module. So it's kind of an all in one. Um, and all of that stuff comes at the same cost, which is also nice. You get way more for what you're paying. So I, I think that's another reason why he was pretty drawn to it because it gives so many additional features. I, I believe there was a comment that the service that we are looking to switch to is familiar with the process of taking on outlying bills from providers. Yeah. So th this is not the first time they've seen something like this. Other questions? No other questions, then all in favor of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Resolution is adopted. Item 35, resolution approving an amendment to 7 2024 provider contracts for the Health and Human Services Department. Speed resolution number 24 82. Um, I will not list all of the contracts that need to be amended. I see them all there on the resolution. Um, I will start with the further result. The Community and Health Services Standing Committee is hereby authorized to amend any of the above contracts by not more than 15%. The further result that the Director of the Health and Human Services Department, Ms. Tricia Clements, is hereby authorized to sign the above contracts on behalf of Bridgestone County in accordance with the resolution. The further result that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passage and publication. And this is being offered to you by the county board members of the community and health services committee on October 3rd of 2024. Okay, resolution. Do we have motion? I'll make a motion. By Supervisor Kramer, second by Supervisor Fruit. And discussion, Trisha is here. Well, these are seven contracts that we're asking to make amendments on. Four of them are through our comprehensive community services to help provide our crisis service. And the last is Southwest Workforce Development Board, which we have leased employees, and so we have to one through our CCS program, and that is why we have a huge cost. Does anybody have questions on any of these? I would just like to make a comment. Yes, Mr. Brewer. Over the years, we have labored and sweated and examined these kinds of requests to the point of uh, meaningless dialogue. And it's good. Now I'm Totally convinced. We've got good transition here. We've got good transition in the board. So let's do county business. Questions? Other questions? And all in favor of the resolution to make these amendments say aye. Opposed? One abstention. Abstention, Supervisor Woodhouse. Item 36, a resolution approving the 2025-2027 Richland County Aging Plan. This will be resolution number 24-83. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors of the 2025-2027 Richland County Aging Plan, a copy of which is on file in the County Clerk's Office, is hereby approved. Be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately, immediately upon its passage and publication and is again being offered to you by the County Board members of the Community and Health Services Standing Committee on October 3rd of 2024. Resolution. Do we have a motion? Motion by Supervisor Glassman or second by Supervisor Williamson. Any discussion on this? This is a plan that we need to do every three years for our aging programs. Um, it just really is a plan that talks about how we serve people, who we serve, um, and different projects that we're going to do. It's pretty standard. Yeah. Anybody have any specific questions on the plan? Is 
not, then all in favor of adopting it, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Plans adopted. Thank you. Uh, item 37, a resolution relating to Richland County's participation in a state program providing specialized transportation assistance. Speak resolution number 24-84. Uh, therefore, be resolved by the original county board of supervisors of the original county department of health and human services and this director are hereby authorized to prepare and submit to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation an application for assistance during 2025 under Wisconsin statute section 85.21 in accordance with the requirements issued by the Department of Transportation, being further resolved that a sum of not less than $15,978 of the amount budgeted for transportation funds for the Department of Health and Human Services. Transportation account in 2025. Uh, Richland County budget shall be used as the 20% matching cost uh, county cost share portion of the program for specialized trans transportation assistance, with, with county contribution will enable Richland County to receive the $79,889 grant, which has been allocated to Richland County for 2025 by the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, again in accordance with Wisconsin statute section 85.21. Be further resolved that the director of the Department of Health and Human Services, Ms. Tricia Clements, is hereby authorized to execute a state aid contract with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation under Wisconsin Statutes 85.21 on behalf of Richland County. And be further resolved that this resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passage and publication. This is once again offered to you by the county board members of the Community Health Services Standing Committee on October 3rd of 2024. All right. That's the resolution. We've been motion by Supervisor Kramer, second by Supervisor Fleming and Patricia. Sure, this is a grant that we take on a basis. It's part of our volunteer driver program and our public transportation program. Something we do every year. Any questions on this? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Right. Item 38. Resolution approving the purchase of new network switches for Pine Valley Community Village. Speed resolution number 24-85. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Richland County Board of Supervisors that approval is hereby granted for the purchase of new network switches for the Community Services Building and be further resolved. Um, I think that should say uh, Pine Valley Community Village, not Community Services. Right. So, yes. Um, and be further resolved that the quote received from JCOM Technologies and the amount of $28,023.37 is accepted in the cost to be covered by Pine Valley Community Village um, Fund 61. A further result of the resolution shall be effective immediately upon its passing publication. And this is being offered to you by the Executive and Finance Standing Committee on October 28th of 2024. Resolution say a motion. Motion by Mr. Gill, second by Mr. Cosgrove. And she's been sitting here for a long time. First to get to this. Already put into our budget, and we've already done it. And MIS will be doing our estimation for it. Anybody have questions? The only uh, change is that uh, Williamson and Frank. Yep, got it. Nothing <laughs> well, to matter. I don't know. Andrew Williamson, Frank. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. That brings us to item 39 appointments to various boards, committees, and commissions. Do we have any tonight? I have none tonight. Uh, do we have any correspondence? There was number 40 in your packet. It was a resolution from, or yeah, resolution 24 2 from the town of Una Vista and Nelson Town Clerk shared. So I put that in the packet for you all. And has that been referred to zoning? Um, I did not refer to zoning. No. I didn't know if it needed to be referred to zoning or if it was an FYI. I just put it in the packet because it was sent to all of us. So. Or if it's this bad, I think I'll just take it. Okay. Second. All right. Well, council will be working on that. Thank you. And no other correspondence. Other permits. Future agenda items. The centers. I had a question when we were going to do the new person for the missing um, the vacancy on the board. I thought that was tonight and then he would be. Uh, no, that's for November. November. Yeah, that's for our November. Yeah. The applications were due Octo um, October 25th and then presented at the next regular board meeting, which would be November 19th. Okay. Thank you. So that will be a future agenda item. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sure. 
We do. Now it's in our current rules. So, yep. So now. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there are no other future agenda items, then looking for a motion to adjourn from Mr. Manning. Do we have a second? Second from Supervisor Kramer. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned.